Today on Point Blank, I will answer your questions. Questions that you have wanted answered by me for many weeks now. Questions that bring up things that you don't understand or things that you think needs clarification. And questions, some of you have questioned really my opinions on, this, on some of these issues I have discussed. Uh, welcome to Point Blank. My name is Patrick Omosage. And this episode of Point Blank is all about the questions you want answered by me. So here's what I'll say. Just say, sit tight, stay tuned, and I'll take my very first and early break, and I'll be right back to answer your questions. Again, welcome to Point Blank. Welcome back. Again, my name is Patrick Oma Osage. My Twitter handle is PJ Osage, and our website is www mbclivetv.com. You can also use the hashtag for, hashtag for the program, which is hashtag point blank. Look, I said I'm going to be answering questions. Why have I taken this? Some of you, I have actually replied you, you know, more on a personal uh, uh, on note. You know, some of you, when you sent in your questions, I, I saw the audience in, in replying you right away. But others, I haven't done that. So I have picked out a few of the many, many questions I have received over the last, God knows, 13 weeks or so. So I've picked out a lot of questions that I'm going to try to answer. And a lot of them, I would say, are kind of uh, uh, very relevant to what is going on. Because, because what I've done is that I've used uh, Nigeria as really my ballpark for, for, for most of my program. I tend to deal with a lot of Nigerian issues than any other issues around the world now. So let me start with this first question. It is from uh, Biodun. She wrote in from southwest of Houston. I mean, I have uh, most of them have you just uh, used their full name, and I, but I don't want to give out their Twitter handles and all that. And her first question is, why do you always seem to compare the Nigerian system with the American system? Uh, why did I pick this question as the first to answer? It's really what, you know, what, what we tend to like to say. It's a good question because I'm sure she's like, why are you always comparing both countries? I mean, one is well over 250 years old and one is, you know, by all, by, you know, status of independence is just slightly over 50. Now, so why do I compare both of them? First of all, I'm addressing an American audience primarily, you know, look. We have a very large concentration of Nigerians here, just not in Houston, but in America generally. So I, I expect most of us to understand the American system. Now, the American system works. That is why, whether you like it or not, that's why most of us are here. It's been a better system for us. Now, my comparison or my putting it aside beside what goes on in Nigeria is not because I'm trying to compare them by age or experience. Oh, but just like, I have nothing else to compare with. Those are the two systems in my life that I have lived with. I grew up in Nigeria. I went to university in Nigeria. So all my formative years were in Nigeria. But the last 20 plus years, I have lived in America. So my understanding of both systems is what allows me draw, not necessarily comparisons, but I can put them side by side and say, here is why this works and here is why this does not work. And believe me, it's not everything about Nigeria that doesn't work. But we do have serious issues. And just, you know, let's use it, let's put it this way. Unfortunately, at times, we don't have a choice when we leave here but to really look at it and say, look, hey, we are all human beings. We bleed red blood. And so things can be done better. Again, thanks, Biodu, for your question. You know, it's unfortunate, but I have no choice but to put Nigeria and America side by side, despite the difference in age and experience. I hope that kind of answers uh, uh, your question. Let me go to, uh, here. here is one from Julius. He uh, also somewhere in Houston. He doesn't really see where he's writing from. And he says, the program on, the, on corrupt American politicians, I feel you only use the Democratic Party politicians as examples. Why? I, I, I'll say I didn't particularly pay attention to that, that I was using just one side of, uh, the American, uh, 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 of American politicians for, my, for, for examples of, polit po uh, uh, of politicians that are corrupt. But let's, I went back and I have checked and I've said, look, 
un it's unfortunate, but really, the Democratic Party have, uh, especially at the state level, they control a lot of cities or states in which, you know, a lot of corrupt practices have happened. Boston, for example, the city of Boston, Boston, uh, the state of Massachusetts, you know, it's a big Democratic Party. They've had problems with politicians, and, you know, a few, a few, a few mayors in Boston have gone to jail. I looked at New Orleans, I mean, uh, uh, after Katrina. Remember, it, w it was being led by a young uh, African-American uh, mayor, you know, who after Katrina, you know, got into a lot of shenanigans uh, in, you know, in what we do all the time in Nigeria, which is uh, padding, uh, uh, not padding, I mean, we, we, what do we call this? Um, you know, the, the issue of uh, contracts, you know, really uh, moving contracts around and all that. He's also in jail. I mean, I talked about uh, the New York um, uh, Senate president, uh, the, the state uh, senator, no, the speaker of the House of, uh, of Congress in House of Representatives in New York. He's also in jail for, you know, what we do all the time in Nigeria. I didn't particularly pick out uh, Democratic politicians as, uh, as examples, but, you know, Fortunately, unfortunately, that's who they are. Uh, Kwame Kilpatrick, 27 years in jail, mayor of Detroit. They call him the hip-hop mayor. He's a Democrat, you know. That, that's not my doing. That's just exactly what I saw. Again, I would add this. While I was also studying this, I saw, also looked at every major city in America that is being controlled by Democratic politicians. They, seem, they tend to have a lot of shenanigans in, 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 political, in their political life. I mean, stop me saying that you can do your own research. But, you know, Julius, you know, thanks for that question. And, I, you know, like I said, when you asked the questions, I actually looked at what I did. I went back and watched the program. And I think I must have used maybe one or two uh, uh, Republicans uh, that are in jail or that are have, having problems with the system, too. Uh, but if you thought that this was all concentrated and being a Democratic politician, I would say, I'm not going to say sorry, but, you know, that wasn't my intention. Let me take one break right now, and I'll come back and, you know, answer some, of, some more of your questions. So we'll take that break right now. Welcome back. Ebun, who watches uh, this program on the Internet? Uh, and she says she resides in Katy. Uh, she asked a very simple question. What do you think of President Buhari? Uh, because she puts, she asks, you've done a lot of uh, programs on his government. Uh, what do I think of President Buhari? Uh, it's a tough, when I say tough, it's tough for me to really answer that without uh, being too, uh, not really political. Those that know me and those people that have I have discussed pol Nigerian politics with on the outside of the program tend to know that I'm, I'm not a big fan of Buhari, not as a person, but as a president. Because, first of all, I just thought that he was not... I know when I say he was too old, everybody will go to his age. I just felt he wasn't the right person at the time, at 2015 and beyond, to rule Nigeria, I thought we needed someone younger, someone a lot more dynamic, someone a little bit more open and has traveled a lot, understands, you know, modern economics and all that. But again, we all thought he would probably employ people and put them in positions to help him out with those things because this is not something you learn on a fly. This is something you must have been invested in. And I, I have said, you know, in the 30 years he was out of power, I don't think uh, President Buhari did much. I'm not going to say to improve himself, or, but to understand the way the world works today. And I think we are seeing that with a little bit of some of the policies he's, uh, he's trying to put through. I mean, he still, when you look at um, the fuel subsidy issue, it took them some time before they, you know, they came out of the policy. You look at you know, the monetary policy, it's quite incoherent. Uh, when I use uh, when I say that, I'm going to get to a question at, uh, later that someone was asking me about uh, the monetary policies that we are. So, what do I really think about President Buhari? I think he's good and he's bad for Nigeria at this time. Good in the sense that he has a lot of support. I, about time that we had what I consider 
a popular president. People, I mean, someone that people are really willing to back, despite, because you see, despite his flaws and all that. So I think that is good for our system. I think we need someone that can really bring the majority of people to his side. Now, bad is that uh, I think this, it, his, his government is very sluggish. I mean, and I hope, you know, people don't see this as more like or more of a political statement. I, I, I personally think his government is sluggish. We're two years into it now, I mean, or well into our second, his second year in office. And uh, it's tough to put a handle on a policy going forward. You know, everything seems a little bit muddled. But look, that's why they have four years. So what do I think of President Buhari? I think he's okay. I don't think he was the right person at this time, but he's there. You have to accept it. You've got to move on and let him work. And let's see what happens in four years. He was given four years. I mean, four years mandate, it's, uh, you know, let's see what happens uh, in, in, in the next couple of years. I mean, so that was from Ebu in Katy. Uh, here is one on sports. Uh, uh, chief, he actually calls himself the Red Cap Chief, uh, and he's writing in from Sugarland. He says, you recently talked, oh, did I say no, this is not on sports. I mean, he actually says, he, he said, uh, you talked recently about agriculture. Agriculture not being the solution to Nigerian problems. So what do you think the solution is? Boy, I mean, people get paid a lot of money to, to solve problems. I mean, I don't know whether what I say or what I do can solve the problems we tend to face right now in Nigeria. But if you remember, and you go back to the program, and remember, you can go back and watch past programs on, on the website of, the, of NBC, uh, nbclivetv.com. You go and you find uh, Point Blank as one of our programs, and you can watch past editions. Here's what I said about agriculture. That it's not the magic bullet. I didn't say it, 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 it's part of what we have to consider as a solution, but it's not the magic bullet that will solve our problems. Because what are the problems we have? We have a problem of, of unemployment. We have a foreign exchange problem because we buy a lot of stuff outside the country. And, you know, will agriculture solve that? No. I remember in my presentation, I did say that Mr. Simon Kolawali wrote an article which I thought very fascinating, very interesting, and really very enlightening, talking about agriculture not being the big deal it is. Because if you, if you watch the program again, I mentioned every Nigerian president has had something about agriculture, from Operation Feed the Nation to Green Revolution and to all types of uh, gimmicky names, and we're still where we are. So what is the solution to Nigerian problems? We need to industrialize. It's as simple as that. We need industry. We need to build infrastructural industries. I mean, can you imagine that Nigeria, after all these years, and with all the tomatoes in that country, we just having built our first tomato paste factory after all these years. And everybody knows, I mean, the Nigerian woman or the Nigerian cook, I don't want to be sexist here, both men and women do cook, but the Nigerian cook must use paste, a tomato paste, when they're making soup or any kind of soup. And we're just building an industry that is going to turn tomatoes, raw tomatoes, or, or, uh, into paste after 55 years. Those are the kind of industries we need to start to build because you just don't need people that is going to pick tomatoes. You need engineers. You need people that will work in those places at all types of level, management, engineering, at all types of levels. So that's going to be our solution. We need to start to build industries, infrastructure and industries. And I, I think we'll be able to solve some of our problems that way. Let me move on to the next question. This is Chooks. Uh, he says he's a big football and also a great sports lover, you know. And he talked about my episode on Nigerian participation at the Rio Olympics. You talked a lot about all our missteps, but offered no solutions. Uh, almost like the last question, you know. There are people that are paid to solve problems. I'm not, you know, right now I'm being paid, uh, you know, to talk. 
I mean, I, you know, you might not like some of the things I say, but, you know, I'm being paid to talk. So, Chooks, here's what I'm going to say. You know the missteps we had in Rio. We arrived Rio like no other country in the world, really. Had problems. The football team couldn't get to Atlanta and get out of Atlanta. Some of our athletes, we didn't know how they were going to get there, but they all got there. Then we got there without equipment. We didn't get there with our, our opening ceremony, our, our clothes and all that. Those arrived three days to the end of the, uh, the, uh, to the, end of the festival. We also had the issue of uh, our, our, our football team using fraudulent identification. All these are missteps. I mean, all these are the wrong things. So what are the solutions to this? I'm not big on investigations because every investigation in Nigeria that we've ever done, any white paper or committee or this thing, nothing ever gets solved doing that. But we as a people must continue to ask questions about our leadership. Our leadership is just not the president. Our leadership are the ministers. Our leadership are the coaches. Has anybody, I've seen an awful lot of, uh, I mean, I've seen so many interviews of Coach Siasia, Samson Siasia, who was the coach to the under 23. And nobody, till now that I speak to you and I, I, I'm answering your question, nobody has asked him the question. Coach Samson Siasia, what do you know about the fraudulent identification cards that some members of your football team or around your football team were using? We broke protocol. We broke protocol. It was a criminal offense, really, to doctor documentation that is used in such a high-profile event. Those are the kind of things nobody has asked him. Now, is it because we won just a bronze medal and everybody has forgotten that we did the wrong thing? We must start to make amends in very little areas before we can start saying it's all about the president, it's all about the ministers. No, it's about everybody needs to be accountable. The coach, he's the manager of his team. And if his team is found, was found to have fraudulently doctored their, 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 their uh, accreditation cards and given it to other people so that they can access venues, hotels, uh, uh, football stadiums and all that, that is wrong. And that is why we, have, we must hold people accountable for what goes on in our country. I hope that has answered your question. Like I said, I, you know, this is not a solution-based uh, program. This is an opinion-based program. I talk, I talk about what I like to see. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. I give my opinion on issues, which we call, I give my point-blank opinion on a lot of issues in Nigeria. And if you had watched that program, you would have understood that I was really upset. And that's my opinion. Do you know what? Let me take a quick break and I'll be right back. Welcome back. You're still watching Point Black this Thursday evening. My name is Patrick Omo Osage. My Twitter handle is PJ Osage. Just, I mean, today I'm answering your questions, and most of the questions I'm, I, I have picked uh, to answer today all came on my Twitter handle or the program's uh, Twitter handle, which is hash, hashtag point blank. Okay? So let's keep doing this. It's great to be interactive. It's great for us to actually know what you're thinking and how you feel about the program. Uh, let me go to um, a question from Richmond. Uh, Adeshawa writes, uh, please, can you explain again to me why budget padding is not corruption, in your opinion? <laughs> uh, this was not the only question. Uh, she was not the only person that asked this question. Uh, quite a number of people, but in a variety of uh, forms. How dare you say that uh, uh, budget padding is not uh, corruption? What do you mean by that? Don't you know what corruption is? And I got all types of this. Let me explain the system of government to make this very, very, very understandable. The Nigerian Senate controls what we call the finances of a country. They write how money is going to be spent and where money is going to be spent. 
I don't care how they pad the budget. They can put money to build, rebuild their own house. And they can put in the budget. But who implements the budget? The ministers. The ministry. So if I'm a senator and I put in the budget, I pad the budget with an extra five million to build me a house. That money doesn't come to me. That money goes to the Ministry of Works. The Ministry of Works has to build that house. Now, maybe the corruption we should all be aware of is that both sides become corrupt because there's no way that money is spent without the minister or the ministry being involved. There has to be an understanding. And I go back to my first question about why do I use the American system to compare or to compare the American system with the Nigerian system. I said it's not really what I really want to do, but that's my experience on both, from both sides uh, uh, of the aisle or both sides of the, uh, of, the, of the great ocean. The American system, they have the same thing. Senators, House of Reps, they do pad the budget. They do ask for favors using the budget. That's what we're trying to do. We might be different in the way we implement these things, but that is, again, what we're trying to do. It's senators or legislators asking for favor during the budget process. I know it has been corrupted. Even the American system of what they call pork barrel politics has been corrupted. People ask for the slimy, slimiest of things. I want two million to be added to the budget for the junior college my wife teaches in to do a research. He's not asking for the money for himself. But his wife teaches there, and she's probably going to be part of that research. Research people do get paid some government good, some good government money. I've done researches before. I've been on I've been on research uh, uh, committees that you know that has been sponsored by government or a big uh, company and all that. So I know what it is. So it is it's it obviously it's very corrupting. All I'm saying is that we're making a fuss over nothing, because if the ministers, if the president, who, uh, they, they are the executives, they execute what legislators do. Remember, spending money is a bill, it's a law. It has to be passed and then signed by the president. One group can do both. They all have what they do. So that's really, I mean, I was only really trying to explain that we are fussing over nothing. Because if the executive, they don't want to do it, they can't do, they can't do anything. I mean, the, the, the legislators can't do anything about the money, even though they allocate it to themselves. It can't happen without the collusion. Both parties have to come together to become corrupt. That's what we see out here in America. You know, the pork barrel politics, and like they call it, has become very corrupted. It used to be a good thing, you know, I want something for my neck of the woods, you know, my neighborhood. And so I'm going to ask for some money, but, you know, no more. It's no more like that. So, I mean, I hope that answers uh, your question, Adesha, uh, who wrote in from Richmond. Uh, again, what I'm doing today is trying to answer some specific questions, I mean, from those that have watched this program for the last 13 episodes or so. I mean, I've had so many questions coming. I've answered some directly because, you know, I thought, again, those were ones that I, not because they were slightly personal, but I thought, you know, they needed answers right away in order to go form an opinion that was wrong about the program or about me. But, so, but I'm not addressing those. I've picked out some questions that I think that are generally uh, uh, informa informative to, to the audience today, and so that's why we're doing that. So let me take one last question now. Uh, this is from Felicia, who actually watches us on the web, and she's, uh, she writes from Lagos, which is very interesting. She watches us on the web, and like I said, we do have a, a website, uh, which is www.mbclivetv.com. You go on a program's uh, page, and you, know, you can find uh, 
point blank there, and then you can watch it. So she, she, she writes from Lagos, and she asks about the program in which I uh, title Incoherent Monetary Policy of the Nigerian Government. She asks this very simple question. Why do you think the government is wrong in limiting the money transfer companies to three? Oh. First of all, let's go through numbers. $20 billion was sent from the diaspora into, Niger into the Nigerian economy last year. That was just uh, slightly behind uh, Mexico. Mexico is another big uh, uh, country that receives uh, money from its uh, diaspora residents. Uh, so $20 billion into the Nigerian economy is pretty good money, sizable money. But I don't think the government understood how $20 billion got into that country with such ease. It wasn't fraudulent money. This was money of hard-working Nigerians. Most of you that live here in Houston know how, in the last one year, how easy it, is, it has been to send money home to Nigeria. Very easy. There are over 2,000 money transfer companies operating around the world, mostly here in America and Europe. 2,000. Now, with that ease, a lot of people send money home more regularly, even send more than they would usually send when it was a little bit difficult sending money home because of the trust issue. People send money home because this money transfer companies that came into operation maybe in the last five years were able to access bank accounts directly. Four, five, I mean, really, five, six years ago, when you had to send money, you sent money through Western Union, you had to go line up and collect the money in cash and all that. Now the money went directly into the account of the person you're sending to. That is why we got, were able to collect $20 billion in Nigeria. $20 billion, a huge amount of money. It's because of the ease of the transfer. Now the government comes out with saying that most of them were illegal, and then they have now sanctioned or re-sanctioned just three companies. You're not going to get $20 billion through three companies in one year. It's not going to happen. You're going to collapse the infrastructure. And I can almost give you an example. I didn't know this was going to happen when I even did this, did the program initially. Look, Felicia, I sent money home at one time, right after the new policy came into being. It took 10 days to get there. 10 days. That's just something to, for you to understand. It took 10 days. There were mistakes, mistakes that happened, some that had never happened to me in the last couple of years. It took 10 days, and I was sending to someone using a GTB. GTB was supposed to be one of the best banks. GTB had a problem. But look, there was, a, there was good, good to come out of that. At the time, they would resend the money I sent the money, initial money, at 341 or 339 or something. By time, in 10 days, it had risen to 370 plus. It was good for me. It was good for the person I was sending money to. So look, I'm not thinking that the government was wrong. I think they didn't think about it on a larger scale. Again, remember, I use, this is my own opinion. I think that they were hasty in cutting out a lot of these smaller companies because these smaller companies is what has done us a whole load of good. But hey, I don't work for government. It's my own opinion that I think they made a mistake. And I, I wouldn't be surprised where they reverse because I, I see them actually trying to reverse now. They've, they've added a few more companies all of a sudden and all that. So look, this is what I'm saying. You've got to do your work. You've got to think about uh, ramifications of the decisions you make and all that. So I'll take a quick break. When I come back, I'll kind of wrap up. I'm wrap up in the sense that I'll tell you what I think about what I've just done with answering your question. So I'll take a quick break and I'll be right back. Welcome back. This has been a, a, a program that I've been wanting to do for about four or five weeks now to answer some of these questions directly. 
Look, keep the questions coming in. They've been very, very nice of you guys to watch the program and actually try to interact with us. Uh, we, we like the fact that um, when you have a misunderstanding or a clarification of my opinion, you're willing to ask me using my Twitter handle, PG Osage, or the Twitter handle of the program, which is just hashtag point blank, and you get to us. I want, you, I want you all to keep doing this because it's been very interesting today, tonight, doing this with you. Now, remember, this show airs first on a Thursday night at 8.30 p.m., and then all the rest of the weekend and a couple of days during the week before we, re -air, we, before we put up a new program on Thursday. You, know, you can spread the word around. Tell people, like, look, even though I, I got, I've gotten a few... Um, uh, messages from outside the country, when I say the country, from outside uh, America here. Uh, I'm very happy that that has happened, but it's mostly from Lagos, and that's really from uh, people who maybe stumbled across it through my um, own Twitter page that I do put up the program there. Uh, but I want people outside Houston, I want people within America. So talk to your friends, tell them to go on our website, and they can watch this program anytime, anywhere on our website. So I'll see you all next week, and thanks for watching. Bye-bye for now.